While parts of the country have had flooding, people around Lake Sabaya in northern KwaZulu-Natal have been waiting with bated breath to see if it would make the difference they need. Lake Sabaya, our largest coastal freshwater lake, has been losing its water for the last two decades. For people who depend on the unique environment, the future is looking uncertain. McFarlane Moledi set off to search for explanations. In northern KwaZulu-Natal, nestled in the Maputo land coastal plain between dune forests and ancient peatlands, lies our largest natural coastal freshwater lake. Lake Sibaya is one of our natural gems, and besides its beauty, it supports a host of unique ecosystems, local communities, and their livelihoods. But the lake is in trouble. Stretching across 70 square kilometers, Sibaya can hold more water than the Midmar, Albert Falls, and Inanda dams in the Umgeni River combined. But today, it faces a dismal future as the lake is rapidly shrinking. In the last three decades, Sibaya has lost almost half its water. University of KZN researcher Dr. Lulu Pretorius in the area's wetlands and peatlands and joins a group of experts in investigating the lake's dramatic water loss. With the help of satellite imaging, she shows me just how much the landscape has changed. This is a 1984 image and you can see the lake. So what you can look at is like the white ridges on the edges. <laughs> A time-lapse shows the receding water levels at its most glaring. The southern basin even separated from the main lake in 2015 when a severe drought gripped the region. Since 2016, there's been some reprieve, but the lake continues to drain rapidly. Sabaya Lake at the current rate could easily be dry in 10 years' time. So and I think that is a... That's an extremely scary thought. Sibaya forms part of the Ismangaliso Wetland Park, a UNESCO World Heritage Site, which draws tourists from all over the globe. The local economy depends on it, says Lungisani Ngumalo, a community development worker and member of the Mabasa Traditional Council Authority. That kind of development must be related to the, the ecosystem because we're quite sure that we don't have industries and mines what are so hard to protect the environment, the nature that we have, so that we can create opportunities for the land and to our society. I've been coming here since 1996. There was vast amounts of water here. I mean, we used to come kiting here and massive flatlands of well, mud banks basically that go out for like six, 700 meters. Sudana Bay local Carl Prinsler is our guide for the day, helping us navigate sandy tracks on rural tribal land. After having spent the past decade working abroad, he's back and astonished by the changes. Now, I am quite flabbergasted just coming back to these little areas again and seeing how much water has been. Actually, there's no more water and how, how far the waterline is. Besides being an obvious tourism drawcard, Sibaya is home to KwaZulu-Natal's second largest populations of crocodiles and hippos, just one of the many reasons this lake is conservation worthy. It is one of the most unique environments in the world. It is a freshwater lake that was once estuarine. Um, it's one of the few places where you find saltwater species of fish that have adapted to live in freshwater environments. Hydrologist Mark Shapers explains there are also no major rivers flowing into Sibaya. It's primarily fed by a shallow aquifer, the main freshwater source for the entire region. The Maputaland Coastal Aquifer is one of the most significant unconfined primary aquifers in Southern Africa. It's pristine and it's really high producing aquifer. But the water table of the entire Maputo land coastal plain is dropping fast and Lake Sibaya is simply a symptom of a much bigger dilemma. It means all the wetlands and all the peatlands are drying up because they're all fed by the same groundwater system in that area. The region includes various peatlands between the ages of 3,000 and 8,000 years, as well as the oldest active peat accumulating wetland in the world, an incredible 45,000 years old. When the water table drops below the peat level, the peat dries out, it becomes desiccated, and then it's just pure organic matter and it can ignite very fast and very easily and it can smolder for a, for a very, very uh, long time. Once a peatland has burned, it loses its ability to store water. So over time, the system becomes less and less capable of recharging. The water table has dropped now in places with up to 20 meters. 
big problem, no water, no nothing. Patrick Zikali was born here in 1937 and remembers a time when water was plentiful and a shallow borehole or well would reach the water table. Every day there was water, and there was water. It was water. Full. No problem. No problem. Collecting water from working boreholes has become time consuming and expensive for a community with very little. To get water is long, is far. Far, yes, yeah, very far. How far? Maybe five kilometers? More than five kilometers. For fresh water? Yeah. The people of the region rely on tourism and subsistence farming. The nutrient poor sandy soil doesn't lend itself to intensive crop production, and the felt has a low carrying capacity for cattle. But the one industry that flourishes here is forestry. The big benefit of eucalypts and why it's so attractive is that it's such a fast growing tree. Okay. So within 10 years, you can harvest um, and, and get some money, you know, for the, for, for the wood. Once harvested, the eucalyptus timber is pulped through a chemical process to extract the valuable cellulose fibers. So the bulk of the cellulose pulp is exported and used in the production of textiles like viscose, rayon, and a range of other products like washing powders and cosmetics. There are two state-owned plantations in the vicinity of Lake Sibaya that were established in the 1950s. But because the eucalypts thrive in this area and they offer relatively easy and guaranteed income to landowners, small plantations have mushroomed all over the landscape, many without the necessary water licenses. Although water consumption figures vary greatly, most experts agree that eucalypts are very thirsty. The amount of water one tree uses depends on many factors, including which side of the fence you're sitting on. Conservatively, a tree like this uses about 40 litres of water per day. One tree, that's about 150,000 litres of water over a 10-year lifespan. We've got 30,000 hectares under, under trees, and the problem with trees is you, you can't switch them off. Um, and particularly eucalypts, um, they've got a rooting system that just keeps going. Of course, the population has also expanded greatly over the past 20 years. But even so, Shaper says the amount of water used by people is nowhere near the total consumed by forestry. The eucalypts and the pines are using um, one and a half to two orders of magnitude more water than any other contributing factor. Simply put, this means that the people of Mkanyakute district use about 1,000 swimming pools of water per day. Conservatively, the eucalypts consume 47,000 swimming pools of water every day. It's a big economic injection in that area to have eucalyptus there, especially for small growers. And it becomes a, a juggling act of how much are people willing to offer up, you, you know, their income, the little bit that they have, to still have access to water. It is becoming clear that the Maputo land coastal plain can no longer support extensive forestry and the Department of Environmental Affairs and Forestry has placed a moratorium on the issuing of water licenses for commercial plantations. But it seems some people are desperate and some even ruthless. In our travels, we stumbled upon a freshly ploughed field, which subsequent inquiries revealed as an illegal plantation in the making. There is talk of replacing eucalypts with macadamia, but Shaper says this is not a viable long-term solution. Macadamias are only slightly less thirsty than a, than a eucalypts. Um, the only advantage of macadamia is that it, um, it doesn't have this rooting system that's like hugely aggressive. It's going to chase the, the groundwater condition the whole time. Um, but unfortunately, if you're going to grow macadamias, it's going to be a commercial activity. And the first thing people are going to do is going to say, well, right, let's ensure that our crop is productive. We're going to put it under irrigation where they're going to get the water from the groundwater. But whatever the solutions are, they need to be put in place with real urgency, says Pretorius. If lakes are bio dries up, in time you might look at impacts like saltwater intrusion because now the groundwater level has, has dropped below uh, sea level and you start getting influx from seawater. Um, and then, of course, it has a massive impact on tourism in that area. That's one of the reasons why people go there. Isimangalisa Wetland Park is named after all its wetlands, so it kind of defeats the purpose if all the wetlands are dry. Thank you for watching our stories here online, and please subscribe below to become part of our YouTube community and be notified when we upload our latest content.